to give and uh, be a blessing um, as the Lord gives us opportunities. And so praise the Lord for that. I'm going to have a word of prayer. We'll take up our offering for this evening. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you so much for this time that we have. And Lord, I pray that you would guide through this evening. Uh, help us, Lord, to be focused on you tonight. I pray that you would be with this offering taken up, Lord, maybe to your glory and honor. Um, Lord, may we strive to do what you would have us to do, Lord, focusing on you and your will. Uh, bless and use this money to be a help and a blessing to somebody and an opportunity to get the gospel out. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Thank you for that offertory. Praise the Lord. And uh, wonderful. Logan, if you wouldn't mind having a word of prayer to dedicate the offering, please. All right, the young people for, I almost said Patch Club. Truth trackers are going to be dismissed at this time, and so they can make their way down. Um, uh, I got a couple of missionary letters. The first one we have is from Go and Danielle Oishi, missionaries in uh, Japan. They have started um, uh, uh, a new church here, and so it is, ex it is exciting to hear from them. Um, it says here, dear partners in the work of God, praise the Lord. Happy New Year. The, the year 2023 uh, was an incredible year full of miracles, and we anticipate in faith that the Lord will do even greater things in 2024. Allow me to recap all God did last year. In March 2023, we completed our time of training and preparation at the Sinrai Newtown Baptist Church in Manu, Osaka, and saw our last soul saved there uh, on one of our final days. In April of 2023, we took our first pastorate as the interim pastor of the Emmanuel Baptist Church in Neoro Hokuada, Hoko Iada, <laughs> to cover for another missionary family. And God allowed us to see um, uh, a total of 16 souls trust Christ during our six months there. Finally, in October of 2023, we planted our first church, um, the Kasarazu Hope Baptist Church, um, and God gave us an incredible gr grand opening with 23 first-time visitors and one soul coming to Christ on uh, Christmas Day. In 2023, God allowed us to see a total of 18 um, souls come to Christ, and since starting in Kasarazu, Hope Baptist Church, we have had the privilege of hosting four missions trips for supporting churches in the U.S., and 33 different people have come to our different church services, not counting our visitors from the United States. We are so thankful for your continued part in it all, and praise the Lord for that. I think we got a couple pictures here um, uh, of the work that they're, they're doing. They're part of it. They're a little bit fuzzy, but uh, it's good to see the Lord working there. Um, we'd like to begin this month's report covering some of what um, did not fit into our previous report covering December 2023. Back in Manu, Osaka, we received, we received the wonderful news um, uh, that the younger sister of the um, last soul we had the privilege of leading to Christ there got saved at their Christmas Eve service. Please continue to pray that the rest of the dear family of seven would come to Christ, and that the two who are now saved would grow in him. The same day here in Kasarazu, 
Um, we held our last grand opening Christmas service, and we wanted to mention that two of the many visitors who came that day were volunteers. Um, uh, we met at a local historical museum, a part of a group of people in Japan who are known to be some um, of the most difficult to reach, um, as they are so deeply rooted in the history and culture um, of idolatry in Japan. Three of our visitors came from contacts at our group from Ohio made by playing pickup basketball, trying out all these unusual methods in Japan and seeing what God did through all of them has taught us that God works in ways beyond what makes sense to us. On December 30th and 31st, we held special New Year's Eve fellowships with our church to get better connected with the people who have uh, come since we started. After our December 30th fellowship, uh, we went to one of the properties owned by our faithful attendee from Hong Kong to dedicate it to the Lord. Uh, we praise God for not al only allowing us to see lost people hear the gospel message for the first time, but also to see saved people grow and be used of the Lord. Um, we had our first youth activity January 5, 5th, and throughout the month, we have been able to connect with the contacts God has allowed us to make thus far, both saved and unsaved. On a much more personal level, though, visitation and special activities in our home, such as cooking and English conversations on January 7th. Uh, okay, cooking conversations. On January 7th, um, we had two more first-time visitors come to our church, both yet to be saved but desiring to come regularly. We, look, um, uh, we took our first offering on that day for a church that was affected by the Noto Peninsula earthquake disaster. We had uh, um, a saved visitor from the UK start attending our church on January 28th, um, uh, and he has come faithfully every week since. The lost Japanese man who introduced us to the lady who got saved in Christ Christmas Day had also come faithfully for the very had also come faithfully every week. The Christian man from Hong Kong and his two sons have also come faithfully since our fourth week of holding services here uh, when, when he came um, as our first time visitor. I just mentioned seven people who are now attending regularly and currently our church office that we are uh, also using as a temporary auditorium to staff, staff start off, I'm sorry, to start off in, uh, in can only take seat 10. Whew, are you following all this? It's just small writing and a lot of wording. So in our Christian school, we've got this little thing, right? So it's got like gray on the top and gray on the bottom, and it's got a green see-through thing in the middle. And so the student can use that to put over the sentence so they could just look at the sentence that they're working on, and then they can move it down to the next sentence. And I almost feel like I could use that right about now because somehow it just printed out tiny, tiny print. And so, and he's got a lot to say, bless his heart. <laughs> <laughs> and so, praise the Lord. Um, we maxed out our parking lot space towards the end of the month, and as many as our visitors have mentioned wanting to bring more visitors, we anticipate that we will soon be maxing out our church office auditorium. We praise God that we are already looking for a larger meeting space for our Sunday school services, our Sunday services, I'm sorry. We currently have a potential meeting space booked for Resurrection Sunday, that, if all goes well, may become our new meeting location. It is located right on the northern edge of town in the Canedra, Canida neighborhood, where all the new development is taking place and the population is growing rapidly. Thank you for praying for God. Thank you for praying for God to open the right door for us and that he would continue to build this church, your friends and co-laborers in Japan. Go and Danielle Oishi, praise the Lord. Um, doing a wonderful, wonderful job there. The second letter that we have is from Charles Osgood, the Osgood family. And uh, they put this, Dear friends, thank you for your faithful prayer and financial support, influence in Sierra Leone. In 2017, Pastor Solomon Gorvey, who pastor the church in Sierra Leone and oversees a ministry of about 20 churches, sent a young man named David Brooks to us to train for the ministry. 
David completed our uh, training program, and upon graduation, he returned to Sierra Leone to serve the Lord. God has recently started um, a church in Gibaniga, Gibaniga, and he also oversees an orphanage there. This is what David is doing now, right? He also is or overseeing an orphanage there. Last year, he was able to lead a man named Julius Alpha to Christ. This man was pastoring a new apostolic church, yet he was unsaved. After getting saved, he preached the gospel of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone in his church. Because of this, he was fired from his church. He's now working to help David and his church. Please pray for the new converts in this church plant to uh, be established and to grow. Pastor Solomon Garvey was invi has invited me to come to Freetown, Sierra Leone to help train soul winners. I will be traveling to Sierra, Sierra Leone uh, next Monday, February 19th, and uh, we will have four days of soul winning training um, I will give classroom instruction and will also have time for practical application and soul winning. We're, ex we're expecting um, between 60 to 70 pastors and church workers to come for the training. Please pray that through this training, many men and ladies will become faithful and effective soul winners. After the soul winning training, I will visit the ministry of David Brooks. Uh, please pray that God will use me to encourage him and also to be a blessing to the church um, he is pastoring. Converts, disciples, he says. In my last letter, I asked prayer for a new convert, um, Akua Nekuruma, to follow the Lord in baptism. Praise the Lord. He got baptized on December 17th and has since joined the church. On December 10th, my convert, Prince Akuoko, Akuoko? got married to Selena. He and his wife are attending my Sunday school class. On January 6th, Selena followed the Lord in baptism and has joined our church. Please pray for this new couple to grow in the Lord. We have continued our soul winning at a nearby university as they have recently started a new semester. In the last two weeks, I have been able to lead five students to Christ. Please pray for us to lead more students to Christ. Also, uh, please pray for the students um, who have trusted Christ to be established in the faith and to become disciples of Christ. And praise the Lord for that. These are those that got baptized. There's uh, Brother David and Brother Alpha, the ones that he mentioned in the beginning of the letter, on his way to Sierra Leone. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> um, on his way there, he did post this on Facebook and it's kind of encouraging. Please pray for us as we head to Sierra Leone. We will be conducting soul winning uh, training for a group of pastors and workers. The harvest is plenteous and more laborers are needed. Pray that God will use us to help many to become faithful and effective soul winners. And that's, of course, Charles and his son Josiah. So praise the Lord for that opportunity um, uh, that they have uh, going there. And God has been good in uh, using them in that ministry. All right, those are our missionary letters. Uh, our young people at this time can be dismissed to go to their class where they will have to miss out on the Bible study happening in here, uh, which is too bad. But praise the Lord, they'll have a good time over there. We do have a couple of announcements. <clears throat> so you'll want to keep these things uh, in mind. Um, Sweetheart Banquet is tomorrow. We're excited about this. And is that driven to 630? Um, uh, they are doing a, it's referred to as a Friday night fish fry. It is, it is interesting to me how many things that are more common, our young people don't understand where that comes from, right? Why is it there's always a fish deal at restaurants on Friday nights? Because it ties back to the Catholics for many, many years having their Lent or whatever they had, and they would do fish on Fridays, part of that or whatever. And, uh, you know, I, I found out recently that um, uh, GET, a school district around here, gets out early on Wednesday every week. And I don't know why that is. I think it's a strange thing. Maybe, what's that? I'm sorry. Oh, I thought it was every week. I don't know. They got out early on Wednesday. And so I, I, I was curious why that was. I really have no idea. Anything I say from this point on is total speculation. 
But maybe it goes back to people being in church on Wednesday night, <laughs> and they wanted to let them out early so they could, you know, get to church at, at a decent time. I don't know. I, I do know that um, many of the, you know, it's very Lutheran and Catholic around here, really, and so many of the Lutheran um, confirmation classes and the Catholicism, the, the Mass, whatever they do, um, uh, those kinds of classes are on Wednesday night, and so I don't know if that has something to do with it or not, but what does that have to do with the sweetheart banquet? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, right. Oh, I, I know why, because we're having a Friday night fish fry on Thursday. That's what it was. Right, right. So they have a Friday night fish fry, and uh, they're, they, they, we could choose that as part of the dinner for tomorrow night. And so we're doing that, right? Um, and so I think that if I remember right, there's a couple different kinds of fish, um, like a, a broiled type fish or battered fish. Um, and I think there's also chicken involved in that. And so, did I say something wrong? You said that they were having fish, but they also are having chicken, isn't it? Right. Is that funny? No. Well, there's something in this ass. I don't know. Anyhow, y'all come tomorrow night. You're going to like it. That's one of my announcements is about that, right? right. Sweetheart Banquet. I did. I did a game. Um, recently with, uh, with our family. That was a lot of fun. And so we're going to do that as part of the events for tomorrow night uh, also. And so um, you'll enjoy that uh, tomorrow evening and uh, 6.30 over at Drugan's. And so uh, praise the Lord for that. Um, this Saturday is a memorial service for Willis Loomis. Um, everyone in the church is invited to come. There's certainly going to be family here. We are asking our church a couple things. Number one, pray that this Saturday goes well. There will be lost people there, and they will hear the gospel. Um, so pray that, uh, think about it throughout the day, right? One o'clock is the service. Think about it and pray for those who are hearing the gospel, that they would be receptive um, to that. Um, as part of this memorial service, we are providing a meal. Um, if you are able to help out with that, that would be a tremendous blessing um, if you're not able to come, we understand that, but if you can still help out, even though you're not coming, that would be a tremendous blessing. And so um, any kind of, and you could talk to my wife or any details about that, but we do need to make sure we have enough food. Funerals are the hardest thing to plan for when it comes to food. We've had funerals at our church where we've had 10 to 15 people, <laughs> and then we've had funerals at our church where we've had over 100 people, more than could fit in this auditorium, and you just never know. Um, and so we want to be prepared for that. We're, you know, we've got a number in mind to at least be prepared for, and so we want to make sure we have enough food for that. So if you could help out with that, that would be a tremendous blessing. That's this Saturday coming up. Um, and this is Rick's dad, of course, and so we want to be a blessing uh, to them. Um, the first Saturday of the month is John and Roman distribution and soul winning. And uh, you can be here at the church at 10 o'clock to be part of that, and that will be a, a blessing to you and to those who get John and Roman, the truth of the Word of God. And so... Uh, praise the Lord uh, for that. Our verse, theme verse for the year, Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. As part of that theme, we actually started our adult Bible study again. Um, it's the third Saturday of every month. We started it this month and really had a tremendous time with that. Several Quite a bit of folks come out. I know there's a couple of folks that wanted to come that couldn't because they weren't able to make it that weekend. Um, uh, but still, we had a really good turnout, really good food. Praise the Lord. Enjoyed that. Um, it's just a tremendous, tremendous time. And so uh, really, really went well. We're just enjoying that. And so we just want to want to have ways to um, encourage each other and, uh, and, and provoke one another right unto love and to good works. Our emphasis for this quarter is learn to praise. Um, uh, praising one another and look for areas to uh, praise those around you that, that have been doing extra uh, for the Lord. And so we're very thankful for the opportunity God's given to us. Isn't it good? Isn't it good to have godly friends? Uh, it really is. Brother Ted Dahl preached in our chapel today. Um, tremendous message. Just a, just a great, we really enjoy having him come up. And uh, I, I knew Brother Dahl in college. We went to college together and his older brother Andy. And so uh, it was a, bl it's a blessing to know someone over the years, right, that has just been faithfully loving and serving the Lord. And so it's good to have godly friends. And you want to 
you know, establish those relationships and, and continue to grow in those things. And so praise the Lord, praise the Lord for that. All right, those are our announcements. Tonight we're in John chapter number 20. We are continuing in John chapter number 20. And we have, <clears throat> we have, uh, we started, of course, in John 20, and we, we looked at the first half of this chapter um, last week, and then um, we're going to get into the rest, the rest of this chapter. Um, it is interesting that the Lord said, you remember, in, in chapter number 19, he was crucified. Verse number 30 says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Right? The Lord Jesus died on the cross that day. In verse number 30 of chapter 19. Um, by the end of the chapter of chapter number 19, there were those who were coming to, this, to the body and, and preparing it, uh, to some extent at least, um, for burial. And um, uh, you remember Nicodemus was there, verse number 39. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night. Remember that, Nicodemus, chapter number 3. Um, uh, and, and others, right, and they were preparing the body. But then in chapter number 20, we see the first day of the week, Cometh Mary Magdalene, the first number one, right early. So she was there early in the morning, the first day of the week. Um, and that's where she discovered um, uh, that the body was not there. And the, the stone was rolled away, and she realized the body wasn't there. Um, and she went and told, or she runneth, the Bible says, and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And she let them know something's wrong. The body's not there, right? And she... Um, uh, and they ran, they ran there, and, and uh, Peter ran ahead and got there first, and then, I think that's right, Peter therefore went forth, and, uh, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulcher, verse number four, so they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, right, so the other disciple, that would be John, outran Peter, and got there, um, and came first to the sepulcher, so John gets, gets there, and then uh, Peter gets there second, but Peter's the first one to go in. Verse number five, and he stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went uh, he not in. So John didn't go in, but then verse number six says, then come at Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and see at the linen clothes lying. So they realized um, uh, that Mary's suspicions, because the stone was rolled out of the way, are true, right? The body's not there. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, they left. The Bible just says in verse number 10, then the disciples went away again into their own house. And so Mary's just standing there alone. Um, and so Mary is there and she's wondering what's happening. And the Bible says in verse number 11, and Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. And see two angels in white uh, uh, sitting, the one on the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Right? So Mary is the one who goes in and actually sees these two angels. Um, and then the Bible says in verse number 12, And see it, the two angels in white sitting, one on the head and one on the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Verse 13, And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? And she saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said... She turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. So she, she turned and saw the Lord. So here's the Lord Jesus, resurrected from the dead, resurrected from the grave, and the first person, and, and, and you remember, right? He, eventually she figures out who he is, but the first person that he reveals himself to is Mary. That's very interesting uh, to me. And so... Um, uh, she turns back and she sees him. She doesn't realize who he is. And then verse 15, Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, that I, uh, that I will take him away. Right? She's just, I don't know if she's really thinking this through, but she just said, where's the, where's the body? I, I want to go get him, you know, and... Uh, then when he says her name, verse number 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is the same master. Right? She realized who, who he was when he said uh, her name. Then verse number 17 is interesting. Jesus saith unto her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. Now, it isn't so much as one may tend to think to themselves, right? Here's Christ in a glorified body, and he's saying, don't touch me, right? 
And we may think to ourselves, well, because she is a sinful person, and he, of course, is glorified now. But I don't believe that's what he's saying there, because we will see at the end of the chapter, as we get into this, um, that the Lord will actually offer himself to be touched by Thomas. And so, um, uh, but I do believe he is teaching here, um, uh, you know, let's not stop the progress of what is happening here. Let's not, uh, let's not get in the way of what needs to take place. For I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren. And he tells her to go to my brethren. We saw in Psalm 22, the incredible passage of scripture of the Lord Jesus on the cross and the description of him and some of what he went through while he was on the cross and then going from that to his resurrection, which is actually Psalm 22, verse 22. And then right from that, right to, um, in my opinion, um, uh, the, uh, the millennial kingdom and, and that time, um, uh, and there seemed to be a gap between the, um, uh, the resurrection and the millennial kingdom. And of course, that would be the church age. But uh, we saw with a little bit of all that last week. And so um, here, verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. And that picks us up to verse number 19. I'm going to have a word of prayer and we'll get into our verses for tonight. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would guide me as I uh, give this lesson tonight, Lord. Help us to learn from you. Uh, Lord, may your word make a difference in our hearts and lives. And Lord, may we not take lightly the, uh, the, the magnitude of what is taking place here, Lord. The, the awesomeness of this pivotal moment in history. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to learn Help it to make a difference, even, even in this Wednesday night. You know, Bible study, Lord, help us to be ready to make decisions for you. We do love you. Guide during this time. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Verse number 19, John chapter 20, verse number 19. Then the same day at evening, right? So we're still talking about the first day of the week, which is Sunday. That same day at evening, being the first day of the week, and that's what it actually says there, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus uh, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Several things about this, right? Christ is now in his resurrected body. Um, some people speculate um, what is our resurrected body going to be like. What will, um, you know, someday, we're not going to get into a big study of uh, resurrected bodies, but uh, some people speculate that we'll have the ability to walk through walls. I don't know if that's true or not. I think they base that upon this scripture. Two different times the Bible says they were in the room, the disciples, the door was shut, and the Bible specifically says, um, uh, you know, it says here, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for the fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them. So it would almost be as if all, the, all of a sudden he's there in the midst of them. Um, and so I don't know uh, that that's true or not, just a, kind of an interesting point. But whatever the case may be, it does point out the fact that the doors were shut. They were in hiding. Um, and the Lord just came in unto them. He was there. Um, and then he says to them, Peace be unto you. Verse number 20, and when he had so said, he showed unto, him, unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. And so they realized who he was, um, and they were glad about it. They were glad when they saw the Lord. And you could imagine um, uh, that they were. And so, so much um, that they were, um, uh, I don't know, it's, it's difficult to say, why they didn't understand. I was reading a passage of scripture today, um, uh, and um, I think it's Luke 9. And I don't remember the exact verse, and I don't want to go through the whole thing, but in Luke 9, he specifically told him, and that's not the only place, several other places, right? He specifically told him that he would have to die uh, and, and be risen again. So the disciples, they should, they should know all this. They, they should be anticipating this. Um, uh, however, they were glad. Um, uh, and they didn't really grasp it for whatever reason. They didn't understand it. But now they see Jesus. They're very glad about that. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. 
Then said Jesus, verse number 21, then should, said Jesus unto, the, uh, unto them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Right? So verse number 21, Jesus told them, as my Father has sent me, so send I you. Right? And at this point, the Lord is sending uh, the disciples out for a task. He's going to have them doing something, and he's telling them, as my Father has sent me, so send I you. Verse 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And so he breathed on them and, and said, Receive the Holy Ghost. And that seems to be the way that the Holy Ghost operated up before Pentecost. Um, up until that point at Pentecost, when the Spirit fell upon all believers and all flesh, right up until that point, the Holy Spirit would come on to people for a specific purpose, for a, for a specific time, for a specific reason, right? Now, here's the Lord instructing them or telling them, um, I'm going to send you, uh, and, he, and he fills them with the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost. Verse number 23, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Okay, they were given the responsibility to go out and spread the gospel. The remitting of sins uh, is through the gospel, and there's no doubt about that. This verse may seem a little difficult, right? This is a difficult passage of scripture, because it almost seems as if the disciples themselves had the ability to remit sin um, uh, and to... Um, uh, what does it say here? To retain, uh, the, uh, to cause people to retain those sins. Okay, this is not a verse that teaches that the disciples had the power to remit or retain sins. Um, this is now a marked difference in the ministry. Um, uh, 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 as, as we see the Lord instructing them to go out and, and preach the gospel, and the, the receiving of that gospel, right, would be the opportunity for those uh, to put their faith in Christ for their sins, and their sins would be um, remitted, okay? Um, and as they reject that message, their sins will be re retained, and they will have to give an answer for their sin. Now, I was talking to someone the other day, um, and they said, Pastor, what, what about um, this passage of Scripture? What, what does this mean? And it, it, it's a portion of Scripture that talks about, you know, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man, you know, to get saved, I'm paraphrasing, but, and, uh, and I, I, I thought what a, it was an opportunity to explain, right, God's word is perfect, and when it seems as if there are portions of scripture that seem to be in contradiction to each other, right, the problem isn't God. <laughs> the problem is us. And so we have to, by faith, accept the fact that the Bible does not contradict itself. Um, and accept what the Bible says, and we have to say to ourselves, what is it teaching? Why is it teaching? Why is it saying that? Is there a reason for that? And so um, we know, according to many, many, many other scriptures, right, that the disciples could not remit sins on their own. Um, uh, and uh, furthermore, there's nothing in this verse to indicate that as far as when they got this news, right? They didn't Rejoice in the ability to have, to be able to forgive sins on their own, right? Or anything like that, right? There's nothing like that. Uh, and so I believe this is, a, this is a marked difference in the gospel going out by the disciples um, as the disciples will become the apostles in the book of Acts and those who have put their faith in Christ and listened to the message of salvation um, and believe, right? Their sins will be forgiven. Um, and of course, those who reject their sins will not be forgiven. Um, uh, and so the Lord gives them this special instruction. He, he, he gives them the Holy Spirit to empower them. And by the way, in Acts chapter number 2, we learn that the Holy Spirit falls upon, uh, comes upon all flesh. The day you got saved, right, is the day the Holy Spirit came in and dwelled inside of you. If you've put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is inside of you. Now, the Holy Spirit wants to work through you. The Holy Spirit wants to do um, uh, his will, God's will in your life through you. Uh, and uh, there, there's no such thing as a, a second filling. It's not a second filling as much as it is a yielding to the filling you already had, the, the filling you already had um, the day you got saved. Uh, and so um, we have the Holy Spirit in us and are we yielding to the Holy Spirit that is in us? 
Verse 24, we hasten, we hasten on here, verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So Thomas was not there. The Lord came in where they were that evening. Um, uh, and so they were, they were very glad to see him and excited about all this, but Thomas wasn't there. Verse 25 says, The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hand the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my side into his side. I will not, uh, thrust my hand, I'm sorry, thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe. And so, um, uh, and, and by the way, um, uh, we, we call him, you know, Doubting Thomas. But the reality is, the Bible tells us in verse number 20, and when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side, then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord, right? They probably needed some evidence themselves. And the reality is they should have believed it to begin with because they had told him during his life, this is what's going to happen. And so Thomas, we kind of label him, but the reality is all of them struggled with the fact that their, their leader had died. And so they said, man, he's alive, and they're excited about that. Uh, they go and tell Thomas when they see him, but he, he refuses to believe unless he can see it for himself. Verse 26, and eight uh, and after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. It is interesting how they always put the fact that the door is shut, right? He made his way in. Um, uh, but he says to them, Peace be unto you. But this time Thomas is with them. He is there. Uh, and so the Bible says in verse number, number 20, 27, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thine hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. That's very interesting, because the Lord could have scolded them um, for not believing. He could have scolded Thomas and said, hey, what's wrong with you? I told you when I was here, you're looking right at me, but yet he had understanding with them and, and with Thomas specifically and and he allowed Thomas to um, uh, to find out for himself the way that Thomas wanted to do and then verse number 28 and Thomas answered and said unto him my Lord and my God he realized um, who who he was then the Lord makes this incredible statement verse number 29 Jesus saith unto him Thomas because thou hast seen me thou hast believed blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. It's actually an incredible statement because it wasn't just Thomas, right? Everybody in that room uh, sort of needed to be convinced. And the Lord is saying, blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. And what a tremendous statement that that is. The more I studied the book of John and the more I looked into the apostles and their working with the Lord Jesus Christ, I used to think to myself, wouldn't it have been great to be at the feet of Jesus when he taught? Wouldn't it be great to have heard from him directly and learned from him directly? But the more I studied through the book of John, the more I realized there is so much more that God has revealed to us through his word after the book of Acts, right, that these disciples never had an opportunity to know. Uh, and, and, and the Lord even said um, uh, uh, that when he taught on the Holy Spirit and the Comforter coming and how the Comforter would come and how he would teach them, um, that there would be much greater things that they would learn because of the Holy Spirit, you know, dwelling inside of them. And so um, uh, there's much greater blessings, um, uh, I believe, much greater blessings for us as we are learning of the Lord today in his complete revealed word. You know, we're, we're finishing up the book of Revelation in our adult, or our, uh, yeah, our adult Bible study. And uh, Revelation is very interesting to me because, um, and I've oftentimes described it as not necessarily a book of practical application, although one could, you know, draw some practical application that you could use. Um, uh, but it's not necessarily a book of practical application, as much as it is privileged information, right? God doesn't have to tell us of the future and what's going to happen. Um, he didn't have to reveal that to us, but he chose to do so so we could know. Um, and so that being said, we have so much more information um, uh, than what these disciples even had. And, and, the, and the Lord even said in verse number 29, Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And what a tremendous uh, truth that that is. Verse number 30, 
And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. It'll be neat, you know, someday to get to heaven and uh, watch some of these things that have taken place. I don't know if it's going to be like a, like a big screen TV we could be watching some of these things. Or we'll actually go back and relive, you know, the parting of the Red Sea or, you know, whatever story you're interested in. Um, uh, if you're able to, to see those things, wouldn't that be neat, I, I, I'd imagine? But so many more things that happened than the Lord did. So many more signs that he showed that aren't even recorded in Scripture. And uh, it's, just, it's just tremendous. In fact, um, I believe that John says, the Apostle John, um, at the end of the very, the very book, verse number 24, this is, the, this is the disciple which testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. And what an incredible uh, statement. And so, um, and he reminds us that, uh, of that as well in verse, verse, number, verse number 30 of chapter number 20. Um, so uh, verse number 31, uh, uh, but these are written, but we, we do know the things that are penned down, like the Holy Spirit has chosen to pen down in the words, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Now that's a great verse. It says, but these are are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Right? How are we gonna how are we gonna know the truth of the Word of God? Through his word, through the Bible. Listen, folks, the Bible is the only thing that changes lives. Um, when I preach a message, I may try to have, and I emphasis the try, <laughs> I may try to have funny stories or something to keep you awake or whatever. But the reality is, no matter how, you know, and I've heard some great speakers, and I've heard some guys that, that they'll, they'll get you on the edge of your seat as they're preaching, uh, and they can get you emotional, um, and they have such an incredible personal testimony, and it's just very moving. But all, and all those things, nothing wrong with those things. I'm all for it, right? It helps us to, to grasp and understand sometimes. But at the end of the day, it's the word of God that's going to change your life, not any moving stories. Remember the young person, my, uh, I'll tell you quickly, my sister was dating this guy and he was unsaved and everybody knew it. And there was a play being done at a local church we went to and we went to this play and it was very, very well done. Um, uh, and at the end of the play, they had this really bright light, you know, because it was Jesus' resurrection. And at the end of the whole thing, they gave an invitation. Um, and there was no preaching. I don't remember a lot of Bible and being done in it, I remember the, the acting it all out. It was a big play, and um, uh, and I remember there was an invitation, and uh, and th this this guy that my sister was dating went forward during the invitation, and like he was going to make a decision, um, uh, and 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 get saved. And, and my mom and dad were all excited, and my sister was excited because he boy he's making a decision for the Lord. And I remember at some point during the invitation, he sort of turned toward me, figuring as a 14, 13, 14 year old kid. I didn't buy into any of this either. That's what he, that's what he was figuring. Uh, and with a kind of a smirk on his face, like, I'm just doing this because I like your sister, <laughs> kind of a thing. Um, and it's really sad, right? But the reality is, so sometimes we get so caught up in things that are very well done and we feel like, man, it's moving. I remember going to Sight and Sound Theater, and that's a very well done production. I mean, I encourage you, if you ever have an opportunity to go to that, you would enjoy that. Um, uh, but at the end of the Sight and Sound Theater, um, they gave an invitation, and they um, had an opportunity for you to get saved if you wanted to, right? They would show you, and I'm sure if you went forward or if you found somebody that worked there, they would probably show you from the Bible the Word of God. I'm, I mean, it's a great place, great organization. Uh, but there were people there during that invitation time with some music going on, uh, and they were, they were, those people thought they were in church. Those people thought that they were, you know, filled with the Holy Spirit and all that. But the reality is, right, it's, it's not a production that changes lives, it's the word of God. And so and that's, what, that's what John's saying here. These things are written, and many other signs did uh, Jesus in the presence of his disciples. Verse 30, 31, but these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, right? The, this, we have the word of God so that you can know 
the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple thoughts this evening with a little bit of time we have left. Um, uh, Thomas is known as a, a, um, a doubter, right? Thomas the doubter, and he certainly showed signs of not wanting to buy into anything without seeing it for himself. Doubt and deception are tools Satan uses, us, uh, uses to get us uh, unproductive for the Lord. Um, doubt and deception, right? Um, Genesis 3.1, the first thing that the, the, the Satan said when he comes on to the scene. Is yea, hath God said? Or did he tries to fool the woman into, um, uh, you know, taking of the, the tree that was forbidden. Um, in Matthew chapter number 4, the first thing Satan says, if thou be the son of God, he's automatically casting doubt. Um, on, on what was happening. Revelation chapter 20. Take your Bible, if you would, to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20. We were just looking at this the other night. <clears throat> Revelation 20, verse number 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a, a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. Now, in case you weren't sure who it was, right? The, the Bible's making it very clear. This is Satan. Um, uh, just as a side note, it's very interesting to me that it was just an angel. It wasn't Michael the archangel. It wasn't Gabriel. It wasn't God himself. <laughs> he didn't need all that. Satan is absolutely no match, right, to the power of God. Um, almost like he just, as I said, you know, Bible said, right, sent an intern or whatever. Um, and then they're probably, you know, people have speculated, and it seems to be true according to Scripture, right? There are different levels of angels, and angels have certain responsibilities, right? This is just an unnamed, you know, hey, go take care of this kind of an angel. And so he goes down with this chain in his hand, and he, he uh, grabs hold of um, uh, Satan and bound him for a thousand years. Verse number three, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. And that's what Satan does, right? He deceives. He's it's deceitful. Um, uh, we see also here in chapter number 20. Uh, notice if you would, verse number 7 and 8, what happens after a thousand years? Verse number 7, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to what? To deceive the nations. And that's what Satan's tools are. That's what he does. He, he is deceitful, and he uses doubt and deception to try to make us unprofitable and, and not, you know, um, uh, not useful for the, for the sake of for the gospel and the sake of Christ. Revelation chapter number 12, go back a few chapters here if you're already in chapter number 20. Revelation chapter number 12, verse number 7, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, right? That's, that's what Satan does. He deceives the whole world. He's deceitful. He, has ca uh, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. He's deceitful. He casts doubt. He's an accuser. By the way, Satan is seeking, seeking ways to destroy us. 1 Peter chapter number 5, verse number 8 says, Be sober. Be vigilant, that is sober is a clear-minded, right? Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He, 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 his goal, right, is to make you unproductive for the cause of Christ in any way. Um, and to doubt, cast doubt, and to deceive, um, and to destroy. Now, uh, I'm going to give you a few thoughts here. How to combat against doubt. Um, uh, and I'm going to give you sort of some thoughts out of our passage scripture from tonight, John chapter number 20. How to combat against doubt. We don't want to be unproductive by any means. And we know Satan will use um, uh, the idea of doubt okay, to cause us to be unproductive for 
um, for his purpose. So I'm going to give you just a few things here uh, quickly. How to combat against doubt, number one, be in the right place. Notice we would verse number 24, but Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Now, I don't want to make too much of that. We don't know why Thomas wasn't there. It's not like he was in sin or avoiding them for some reason. We don't know. Um, uh, but I will say this, right? The Lord does have places that we should be. Um, and we ought to be in the right place. Um, sometime throughout your day, you ought to be in the Bible. Sometime throughout your day, you ought to be taking time to pray. Come Sunday morning, the first day of the week, the day we recognize and remember and set aside because our Savior is resurrected from the dead, you ought to be in church. <laughs> We're living in a time when that, that whole idea is being completely lost. And people are finding Sunday to be a great day to get so many things done or get involved in some kind of sports or whatever. Um, and, and, and it's amazing, right? But we ought to be in the right place. And so um, uh, how are we going to combat doubt? We're not going to have um, confidence. We're not going to have the confidence in the Lord that we should have if we're never in the right place, right? Finding yourself in the place where you shouldn't be, in the wrong place at the wrong time, okay? So we want to be in the right place. Number two. We'll hasten on here. Listen to the right people. Verse number 25. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. And so they saw him, and they wanted Thomas to know because they have seen him. They knew because they had heard from Mary, and the Lord showed himself to them. Mary went and court told John and Peter, uh, and then the Lord himself revealed himself to them. Uh, but now they wanted Thomas to know, and they were giving him good news. We have seen the Lord. Now, we need to be careful what we allow ourselves to be influenced by or allow ourselves to listen to. Uh, we got to listen to the right sources and the right people. Um, Brother Ted Dahl came in chapel today and he preached that every decision you make, every decision you make puts you on a path, right? And every path you take leads you to a destination. And what a tremendous message for chapel. And, and you make a decision, it's going to put you on a path. If it's a bad decision, it's going to put you on a bad path. And if you continue down, the path, down that bad path, you're going to end up in a bad destination. Right? And so we have to have the right kind of people helping us make right decisions. God's brought good people into your life. God has brought people into your life that, that care about you and you care about them and, 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 and the love you have for them uh, and, and the love they have for you. We need to be careful to listen to the right people, not allow ourselves to be influenced um, by the wrong, by the wrong people. Number three, have the right attitude. Verse number 25, Thomas would respond to all this, right? But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of his, uh, of his nails and, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe, right? He had the wrong attitude. Thomas already decided it would be hard. He would be hard to be convinced. I'm not going to just listen to you guys, right? And uh, and so we got to have that right attitude. Now, now when you go to the Bible, the Word of God, it's difficult to not have preconceived ideas, or especially difficult to not allow yourself um, uh, to be swayed. By preconceived ideas that you might have. Um, a great example of this is how much we think we know of scripture from Christmas songs. <laughs> and a lot of Christmas songs are wrong, um, or not necessarily blatantly wrong, but they're making assumptions that aren't in the Bible. And sometimes we just assume that's biblical, but it's not really biblical at all. It's just something some songwriter threw in there because it probably rhymed with whatever he was doing with that song. Um, and, and so we have that preconceived idea in our mind, right? And then we assume, as we're reading the Christmas story, certain things happen a certain way. We need to be very careful of that. Never approach the Word of God with your preconceived ideas, but rather say, Lord, I want you to show me what your Word says. I just want to read it. Sometimes we let, let preconceived ideas block us from learning the Word of God, and we shouldn't do that. We should be very careful of that. We've got to have that right attitude that says, Lord, I, I want to know what your Word says, uh, most importantly. And so having the right attitude. Dr. Uh, Evans used to say, attitude is everything. We've got to have the right attitude. Um, uh, listen to the Lord. So we're going to listen to the right people. Maybe even more important than that, listen to the Lord. Then saith, verse number 27, then uh, saith, he to Thomas, that is Jesus, um, reach thither thy finger and behold thy hands. 
Behold my hands, and reach thither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Right? The Lord Jesus showed himself to Thomas. He needed to listen to the Lord. We have the word of God. Listen to the word of God. Listen to the Lord and what the Lord has for you. Um, number, number five, verse number 29, demonstrate faith. Verse number 29, and Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed, right? Demonstrate faith in our lives. Now, Satan's going to use doubt and deceitfulness to try to stop us from being productive for the cause of Christ. We need to demonstrate faith in God and say, Lord, I want to do what's right before you. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. I don't want to figure this out on my own, Lord. I want you to show me what is the right way. Um, uh, and we can combat this doubt and this deceitfulness uh, with some of these simple things here, right? And then demonstrating faith in God or just trust in God and what the Lord would have us to do. All right, I'm going to have a word of prayer and we'll take up our prayer requests for tonight. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you so much for this opportunity we have to be in your word tonight. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to have our hearts in the right place as we consider your working and your dealing with us. And Lord, may we find ourselves loving you. Uh, may we find ourselves wanting to know you more, wanting to know you better. Guide in us, direct in us in our hearts and lives. Be with these prayer requests that have been mentioned tonight, Lord. Have your hand in these things. Help us to do our best in serving and loving you. In Jesus' name we pray these things.